thinking of that. So, I sent you a picture. If, if you oh, can. you sent a picture? I sent it to you. Oh, okay. Facebook. Okay, we'll uh, put that up. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll post it online there for the groups. And so what we can do is in your private moments, uh, uh, visualize uh, what we've gone through here and, and concentrate on Cindy and uh, Annie's, was it Annie's son you say? Her son-in-law. Son-in-law, okay. So uh, yeah, we can continue the, to send good vibes throughout the week too so uh, that that'll help the more energy that's sent the better okay any other comments or questions we'll begin uh, our class on white magic continuing rule 10 that's about covers about a third of the book i think this uh, just as one rule i'll uh, restate it one more time as the waters bathe the form created, they are absorbed and used. The form increases in its strength. Let the magician continue until the work suffices. Let the outer builders cease their labors in and let the inner workers enter on their cycle. The reason this is so important and that he spent so much time on it is this is, uh, uh, is when the, uh, the, you get the idea and the thought of a creation uh, perhaps the most important part is to sustain that energy until it has enough uh, form to be able to kind of sustain itself. So as it says, as waters bathe the form cre created, they are absorbed and used. The form increases in its strength. Let the magician thus continue. Okay, and this is where many works fail is the, uh, the, the initiator does not continue until the form has increased in its strength so it can survive. And so people just give up too soon. And so this is why this is such a, an important rule. Okay, that said, uh, let's, we, let me see where we left off. We were talking about the, uh, the three aspects of mind. The lower mind, the abstract mind, and the intuition. Now these three are linked to the universal mind through the atmic plane, just as the astral plane is linked to the uh, buddhic plane of the monad, he says. Okay, so let's translate that a little bit. Uh, anybody know what the atmic plane is? Joshua, you're a student of uh, esoteric things. Uh, uh, how would well, you do I can assign some words thing? to it, but knowing what it is in, in reality is a different story. Uh, it's supposed to be the, the plane of spiritual will above the Buddhic plane and below the, uh, the monadic plane. Yeah, most people, everybody knows what the physical is. Uh, then we have the etheric double. And next up is the astral, which is the emotional world. And then the mind, which is a mental world. And most people can get a rough idea of what these are. But then above that, it's, it's hard for a lot of people to visualize. Above that is the buddhic plane, which is really a channel from the lower to the higher. And uh, so the buddhic plane is where we access the intuition. The intuition kind of accesses the real higher, higher spiritual stuff and, and brings it down to the mind. And then the atmic plane is where ideas just are floating around, you could say. So if, if you come up with a really new, interesting idea, like maybe Rick did with his uh, uh, a couple of things he has, uh, that idea, if it's original, uh, could have come to from the atmic plane through your intuitive side uh, down to the mind. Now, if you just come up with the idea by a s mental association, that probably didn't come from the atmic plane. But if you get that aha moment where you get uh, an idea that just 
came out seems to come out of nowhere. That could yeah, have come. A light bulb. A light bulb. <laughs> my head went off. <laughs> right. So that's a. Uh, yeah, that light bulb above your head going off, that uh, could be something from the atmic plane. So the uh, uh, the mind, the higher, you have a lower part of your mind and the higher part of your mind. The higher part of your mind links you to everything that you need to be linked to. So it's important that we develop that higher part of our mind. Now, the lower part of your mind, compare that to a computer, okay? It's like our computer processing uh, brain and elements of uh, that's linked to our brain. And uh, uh, that's kind of normal type of reasoning and thinking uh, goes on there. The higher part of the mind is, is called the abstract. It's It's capable of going beyond form to uh, to linking to to ideas and bringing down uh connecting to the intuition uh, connecting to that uh, world of, of ideas and even eventually the monad or your higher spiritual self now you have kind of two higher selves remember you have your soul which is your normal higher self which is as much as the average seeker can uh, handle. And then you have the, uh, the higher self of the higher self, which is called the monad. And uh, that's, uh, that's the pure, your pure spiritual eternal essence. That, uh, and this is what Jesus linked to when he said that I and my father are one. Who he called the father well, there's, there's several uh, uh, dimensions of interpretation of that, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the Father essence of all of us is our highest part of ourself, which is linked to God, which uh, the Tibetan calls the monad. He says, it's interesting to note that just as a monad, Impelled by desire produces that form of life which we call the personality. So the mind aspect as a part of the purpose working out through the universal mind in its form produces that manifestation which we call the manis, manis of putras and the great son of mind on the mental plane. So he's... Uh, um, we have the personality life and we have the uh, the higher self and all this manifestation has come into being so that we can uh, uh, have experience in the world of form. Now, uh, he says, uh, from, uh, he explains uh, Manus, Manus's putras, uh, Manus, uh, uh, is from the word manas, which means mind, and putra means son or child. So that means like sons of mind is what we are. Uh, we're, uh, we're endowed with a fire of self-consciousness, which enables us to carry on trains of self-conscious thought and meditation. Hence, the manas of putras are children of cosmic mind the race of Diana Cohen's and particularly evolved along the lines of the mental principle. JJ, I had a question. Yeah. Well, I've heard that a bunch, but I'm unclear on what that is. Diana's a Cohen's and also Cohen's in general. Well, they're uh, just a way of identifying great, uh, great, Entities, great beings, like say uh, uh, the ancient of days and, and the uh, uh, associates of his. Uh, these are these are uh, just great beings that uh, 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 are the ones that have created everything, so to speak. Do you have any other comment on that or? 
Well, the Maha Kohan is the one who's called the Lord of Civilization. Yeah. It's part of the hierarchy, one of the main ingredients in the hierarchy there. So, so Kohans is what you were talking about just then, right? What, what about Diazana Kohan specifically? Um, I don't recall the exact uh, origin of that word, but I know it's used in relation to very high entities, like uh, maybe uh, Melchizedek or uh, Ancient of Days, the uh, uh, great Camaros that are with him, maybe like the uh, three great Camaros Kimur that are uh, associated with him would be in that category. That's uh, from my understanding. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Well, one of my he, teachers from Spirit called uh, Madame Blavatsky, uh, uh, Diane Kohan. Yeah. What did you say, Edward? One of the teachers uh, that came through Spirit called Madame Blavatsky, uh, Diane Kohan. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's any, uh, any really uh, great entity, and, and by some standards, uh, she would be in that category. Normally, uh, it's associated with people above kind of ordinary mortals, though. But uh, it's like saying a great spirit, so to speak. Uh, you could say maybe uh, some people would think of Gandhi as a great spirit, and other people would think when they, they say great spirit, they would think of God himself, you know, so uh, just different words are used in different contexts. Maybe if we'd studied Sanskrit, we'd have a better idea. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, I think, um, I'm sure Madame Blavatsky or Elsa Bailey uh, went into some, somebody's gone into some detail about the Sanskrit on that, so maybe we'll look that up for next week, get a better idea of to where that uh, those words originated i've been thinking the last couple of days about i think it was dk said that that uh, sanat kamaro came here 23 million years ago and he started working with humans 18 million years ago what right. was he what was he doing for five million years <laughs> he's building shambhala so, okay in addition to that all right besides shambhala there's uh, there's supposedly like 180 cities underground and, and the, like the top 10 cities or, or areas is equivalent of uh, uh, 9,450,000 people living underground. It's like... Uh, no, where'd you get all these figures from? Uh, just quips that keep coming, you know, through uh, uh, YouTube things and, and uh, other yeah. philosophies that I'm... Like there's yeah. this whole hollow earth thing. They have a central sun and there's like a Gartha and uh, uh, Yeah, you never know how much of that uh, is real or not. There's definitely uh, hollow places in the earth and different types of life forms down there. I said, I saw something on the internet. It says Abraham Lincoln told us not to believe everything on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> Honestly. Okay. Okay, the Manas of Putras, these are the sons of mine, the individual principle in man, the ego, the solar angel, in his own body on abstract levels of the mental plane. So the, uh, the higher self is actually has its own body. And um, uh, so it's, it's composed of the, uh, it's called the causal body and it's a, uh, uh, Composed of the higher mental, uh, the higher higher divisions of the mental plane, and so we have these uh, the these three divisions in the uh, lower mind, the abstract mind where we connect to ideas, and then the intuition is also related to mind, and it is capable of pure reason. Now, once once two disciples reach the point to where they can have pure reason together, then they can become one. 
because pure reason sees two different problems from a similar angle when the solutions are looked for. They will, using pure reason, two people using pure reason come up with very similar conclusions. But the lower part of the mind, two minds will come up with a lot different types of solution depending on the programming they're using. There is a chart that we should probably have reference to. It's in Cosmic Fire and other places. It's a chart of the cosmic physical plane where it outlines all of these things you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't uh, studied that, that's a good thing to look at. It would make everything sort of connected in your mind when you look at this chart. Yeah. <laughs> For some people. Other people look at it and think, just be confused. But if you really study it, it's uh, really uh, got a lot of uh, a lot of things to bring enlightenment. Yeah, when I think about these complicated things, I just back in my head says, "Don't worry, there's a chart for that somewhere." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, in the treatise on cosmic fire, you'll find most of those charts. Yeah, yeah. He uh, says later, in in Ray's initiation, I just want to make a, a point. He talks that pure reason is, or rather, love is occultly understood or esoterically known as pure reason. That's, that a really good, that's a really good thing to say. Uh, I don't remember him wording it that way, but it sounds really accurate. Can you uh, for that? one thing, the heart, the heart center is uh, love wisdom. So we think of the heart center as love, but people forget the wisdom aspect is uh, associated with, with pure reason. Yeah, the second ray is a ray of divine love wisdom. Right. And wisdom is often the overlooked part of that. Uh, and then wisdom connects us with the mind. And so uh, uh, the heart and the mind is very closely linked. And then there's an old saying that kind of uh, is the proof in the, uh, uh, the saying, uh, to know me is to love me. Well, yeah. Leonardo da Vinci said, uh, a thing cannot be... Uh, you cannot be loved, loved unless you first understood. No, truly loved. Okay, he says, thus the mind principle brings the soul, the causal body, into existence, and from thence the physical. So the mind principle is behind really all creation. The mind of God is like universal, and it... Uh, has brought everything into existence. And if we want to be white magicians, and being a white magician, we're like gods in embryo where we, uh, we create on our plane with similar principles to which the mind of God created on a higher plane. And so we tune into the mind of God, come down here to our little world, and, and if we're good white magicians, we can create things that will be helpful to the world, to our associates, and to ourselves by using uh, the higher parts of our mind and the principles of white magic. He says, all form taking is the result of desire. That's an interesting statement he made. So you see any form around, it's, it's linked to desire. You see the sun, the moon, the earth, trees, rocks, everything. <laughs> everything, every form that's about us. Uh, well, let's pick something we have made that we know that we have created. Now, say we look at a tree there. Uh, it's the result of some desire of some creator, creative intelligence created the basis of that tree. Now we look at a car, okay? Why is that car in existence? Why is that form in existence? It's because somebody uh, had, or many different people put many ingredients of desire into making your car the way it is. A lot of desire went into making better tires, better engine, uh, high quality gasoline, uh, 
the design so it would look nice. All kinds of desire went into that creation. Now we substitute to your physical body. Look how much more complicated your physical body is than a car. And think of how much desire from uh, a long period of time and many different uh, minds went into creating all these science that went into the creation of your physical body. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, now he goes into uh, the planes a little bit. He says, the right use of physical energy by the initiate gives him freedom of the cosmic physical plane. Now, we talked about the planes a little bit in the past, but as he goes into this, it's important that you realize what it is. Does anybody remember what he means when he talks about the cosmic physical plane? Well, it's everything contained in this chart that we talked about. It goes from the, the mineral earth all the way up to the Adi plane of the, the logos. Right. The cosmic physical plane has seven planes. The seven planes of existence that we normally think of, physical, emotional, mental, buddhic, uh, atmic, monad, and divine. These are the seven planes. And in many trains of thought, people kind of talk like that's all there is. But this is just one plane of a higher plane. And the higher plane is a cosmic called the cosmic. And so this is, the, all these seven planes com, compose just the physical plane on a higher level. And then on the higher level, you have the cosmic astral, the cosmic mental, and so on up. And boggles the mind to think of that. And he never really gives a clear explanation of, of uh, what it would be like in the cosmic consciousness because he himself says he doesn't understand it except just to uh, maybe up to the cosmic astral. He says above that, uh, the masters have a hard time comprehending much about that. Yeah, I'm going to um, read a statement he made, uh, makes here that I can't really put in uh, better language. He says, each center or chakra is composed of three concentric interblending whirls or wheels in which the spiritual man upon the probationary path moves slowly in one direction, but gradually quicken their activity as he nears the portal of initiation. On initiation, the center of the chakra, a point of latent fire is touched and the rotation becomes intensified and activity fourth dimensional. It is difficult to express these ideas in words that can be comprehended by the uninitiated, but the effect could be described as changing from a measured turn to one of a scintillating radiation, a wheel turning upon itself as the ancient scripture expresses it. Hence, by purification, conformity to rule, an aspiration that brooks no hindrance and that ceases not for pain, the aspirant has caused his centers to pulsate and rotate, and then and only then can the master lead him to the presence of the hierophant. The initiate then, with full knowledge of the disciple's ray and of a subray both egoic and personal, and recognizing any karma that may still cling, touches the center or centers which are in line for vivification, and the hidden fire will then rush up and become focalized. Remember always that in the vivification of a center, there is always a corresponding vitalization of the Nogalus head center, till eventually the seven centers in the body and the seven centers in the head rotate in unison. Remember also 
that just as the four minor rays pass into the major three rays, so the four minor centers carry on correspondence and pass into Perlea, finding their focal point in the throat center. Thus you have the three centers, the heart, the head, the heart, and the throat, carrying the inner fire with the three major centers vibrating in unison also. Okay, the three uh, major physical centers, he says, are the ultra major, the pineal gland, and the pituitary. Ultra major is in the, the uh, uh, where the spine connects to the head. And these are three on the physical plane. So what basically, basically it gives a lot of meat there that uh, I couldn't really summarize uh, any better than uh, he just uh, pointed that out. So I thought I'd read that particular thing. Yeah, somebody had a comment? Yeah, what page was that on? Uh, 362 to 363. 362. Yeah. So he gives an interesting description of the centers there and talks about um, uh, how they, they move and, and interact. And he gives an important principle here that uh, in creation we had the one um, vibrate and create the three. And then the, uh, from the three came an additional four. And the seven rays created everything that there is. And corresponding to the seven rays, we have the seven centers. Now, as a creation evolves, the four goes back into the three. So for instance, uh, the higher parts of yourself are always on the three, uh, the first, second, or third ray. The lower parts of yourself are uh, on uh, additional rays. Now eventually as we progress, the rays merge and go back to the trinity or the three. Now this happens in the centers we have the seven centers, and we have three major centers, the heart, the throat, and the head, so to speak. And the lower centers um, uh, merge with the higher. The solar plexus uh, blends with the heart. So the heart and the solar plexus eventually becomes as one center. Now the uh, sacral center, which governs sex, eventually blends with the throat. So the throat and the sacral center become one. And when they become one, then creation, the, the, the focus of creation isn't on going and having as much sex as you can have, <laughs> which that's kind of the idea for the lower man. But the higher, entity looks upon creation as one, not just on the physical plane, but on the creative plane. So it looks at creativity as being one, so the sacral and the throat blend and give the person, the initiate, much higher ability to create, to create on all kinds of levels, from the physical on up to the mental and, and uh, uh, astral so that uh, creation can take place on uh, on all these uh, forms and then the I final think Napoleon yeah. Hill I was going to say I think Napoleon Hill kind of explained that uh, when he said that at a certain time in uh, individuals lives he didn't explain it with the centers but uh, the sacral center transmutes into the throat center, which creates uh, your artistic values. People become artists and painters and blah, blah, blah. 
but uh, th that's the uh, transmutation of the sacral center of the sex drive into the artistic drive of the individual, or what we know right, as the Right, and he, he did a really good job of explaining that. And one, one thing that he said was kind of interesting was, he said most people can't really do that till they're in their 40s or so, because when you're younger, you have such a high sex drive, that's where your focus is, uh, kind of more than it should be. And then he says that, um, he points out that after 40 or so, people, uh, their sex drive diminishes somewhat and they're able to focus more on that uh, uh, creative side. And this is why he says that uh, many people that uh, achieve their greatest success in life after uh, 40, they really start uh, uh, producing uh, uh, strong cre uh, creative uh, energies in the right direction. So that's an interesting thought. Now, if a person has a lot of self-control, he can do it when he's younger, but uh, uh, apparently you don't need as much self-control as you get older, according to <laughs> Napoleon. Well, yeah, your, your testosterone subsides, and so you don't have such a high sex drive. But yeah. The, say the teachings of the Tao uh, are have a lot of teachings on that and, and uh, breath work and things that you can do to help yeah. sexual energy. There's a good book by uh, Montauk Chia, uh, Transmuting Sexual Energy, that really goes into a lot of de lot more detail than, than Napoleon Hill did on it. So, um, I have a yeah, matter of fact, the ancient Greek philosophers, uh, they taught the idea among them was to not, <clears throat> that you couldn't really, uh, uh, be a really good philosophy teacher until you kind of got your wild oats sowed, you know. Go so, so they recommend you go sow your wild oats when you're young and then become a philosopher when you're a little bit old and you can focus more on uh, the higher creative stuff. <laughs> I, I've read a couple of Montauk's books and it's actually really, a, a, if you want to learn to focus, if you have trouble focusing like me, uh, yeah. really really you really have to focus and you, you focus your conscious you know and you start in the sacral and you you move your energy up the spine slowly to different levels till it comes up until you can get it into the head and then back down again to the heart and you eventually you create what he calls the, the microcosmic orbit and the energy flows so you can do it at will mm. and and uh, it's pretty interesting stuff and so you can channel the sexual energy into your creative part and all that kind of stuff. And so we, you know, and you can do it. I, I've noticed more and more people. Now what's the name of this guy, Montauk? Montauk Chia, it's M-A-N-T-A-K. Where's he from? Is he from India or something? Sound he, like a foreign uh, name. He's, I think he's Chinese, um, hmm. but he's here. He's here in America. He has a whole bunch of books. Does he? Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, um, he does. There's a. You can look up some videos on YouTube. Just type in his name too, and it'll. He'll. He has some interesting videos where he's showing people how to do some of the basic. Why don't you post a link to him uh, in the group? Okay, I will. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. JJ, I had a question. Um, going back to when you were talking about the centers, that excerpt you read, the centers, and how they they spin and work in unison. Would that be the same as the beginning of the Kundalini? Um, yeah, he doesn't really explain exactly um, how the Kundalini works in relation to um, all these details we just read, but he does say that uh, the, the centers have to be in a certain degree of alignment before the Kundalini can be raised. So they have to be functioning or, harmoniously, that's the main key to uh, uh, raising the kundalini. And that's the last merging is the kundalini, kundalini with the head center. Right, okay. And so for that to be raised, there has to be all impedi impediments from uh, uh, the uh, flow of energy. So the flow of energy can go uh, uh, up and down. Now there's three, um, uh, channels up the spine and so the uh, the we have energy going kind of up and down 
and, and circulation up and down the spine and that uh, uh, that is unimpeded when the centers are all in harmony with each other. Um, now he's, he says this, this is all really technical, he says, but he makes an interesting statement. He says the coming generation will understand it better. <laughs> now I often wonder That's about nice. that. Are, are we really uh, that much smarter than students were back in uh, uh, Alice A. Bailey's time? Uh, I kind of wonder about that sometimes <laughs> because people still have a hard time understanding everything that he wrote. But he, he keeps saying this, so, uh, future generations are going to understand what I said. They're going to be a lot smarter, you know, so uh, let's hope we are smarter, but uh, who knows? <laughs> Sometimes uh, uh, when you uh, study some of this stuff, you, you feel like uh, you still have a lot to learn, that's for sure. But he says he's, he's just teaching, he says he's just teaching the ABCs of everything. Now. Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty much detail for just teaching the ABCs, but that's that's what he says. So he says, um, if you don't understand something, he said, just put it on the shelf. He says, then sooner or later the pieces will all fit together. And I found this for me when I know when I first started reading his works, uh, I, uh, you know, wondered if I had ever understand any of it. And uh, as I was reading along, I read something when I was first uh, into it that kind of gave me encouragement. And he said, he said something to this effect. He says, if you're reading along and you don't understand it, he says, force yourself to continue. And he says, sooner or later, you'll begin to understand and the pieces will fall together. I found that to be true and this gave me encouragement to continue. And now when I read uh, DK's work, I, can, I read it almost like I might read a novel or something. It's pretty easy for me to read now. Not that I understand everything, but it's, I uh, understand his thought process enough that uh, uh, it's much easier reading now than when I was uh, younger. So anyway, if, if for students that are struggling in reading him, uh, you know, force yourself to continue ahead. And one thing I would do different than I did when I first started is uh, when you come across a word that you don't understand, look it up and make a list of his vocabulary words, especially the important ones that he repeats over and over. Make sure you understand these words. And this will help a lot because uh, uh, like Manus, uh, Putra's things, words like this that he uses, uh, uh, lunar lords, uh, uh, solar logos or whatever, you know, all these different uh, words that he uses that, uh, average people aren't tuned in to uh, look them up. There's a couple good uh, glossaries online and and uh, Mindy and I started one of essential words and uh, we'll have to get that going again. It uh, was the site that it was on was taken down and so uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, one goal is to get that going again. But uh, that's one thing I would recommend students do is to uh, uh, read, uh, uh, look up words that you don't understand. And this will help a lot in your reading. He says, a heart center in man opens the door to what is called the heart of the sun. The throat center opens the way to a full understanding of the path of the physical sun. And all true astrologers must eventually have that center functioning. The head center opens the way to the central spiritual sun. Each passing via the planetary correspondence to the one of the cosmic planes. 
Even those of us who are initiate know practically nothing of the cosmic planes beyond the cosmic physical. Our consciousness is only beginning to be solar. We are laboring in our small measure to overcome those planetary limitations which hold us back from solar knowledge and life. So he talks about these uh, three parts of the sun, the physical sun. The physical sun is important because it gives an emanation of different energies that influences. In astrology, the physical sun is, represents the personality. So your personality is strongly influenced by your sun sign. So if you're, uh, um, say, a, a Scorpio, for instance, Scorpio is has an influence that uh, puts him in situations that uh, teach him lessons that are beyond his control, so to speak. Uh, like, say, things like inheritance, death, and divorce are associated with Scorpio, just as an example. Uh, these are just things that come into people's life that uh, he has to control. And uh, it's, he, he didn't really choose it, they just happen. And this is like a, a Scorpio influence. And, and uh, that's just one of the signs, for instance. Uh, so uh, uh, Sagittarius is a symbol of the uh, uh, shooting an arrow at a target in a, a distance. And uh, the, uh, the influence of Scorpio or uh, Sagittarius, for instance, would be to, to stretch ourselves, to go beyond what we, what we might think our normal capacity would be. And so we have these 12 different influences uh, from the physical sun. Now, beyond that, we, uh, um, have the uh, the heart of the sun, which goes into influences us on the ray of love, wisdom, and then beyond that we have the central spiritual sun, which is connected to, uh, for want of a better word, God itself, and so we have these three uh, powerful. Uh, influences us where we're all linked together. Okay, uh, we're end of our time here. Any comments or questions before we sign off? I think thing that, uh, that I keep coming back to and, and contemplating is that it, it doesn't matter how much you know and how many years, whether it took one year or billions of years to learn it all it's like when you take that whole thing and make a line out of it and then you place that line on top of the eternal timeline it's like your all your greatness and all that your time is like you're nothing but a dot on an eternal line it's kind of yeah. humbling to think of <laughs> <laughs> I see Blaine uh, wrote us a note. He posted a link on the uh, those books that he talked about. Okay. Well, uh, the idea, Rick, is is for all of us to connect the dots. Just little dots. We got to be connected now. Plus, that's the fun part is connecting the dots. Because when you connect the dots, it uh, kind of gives you a thrill, huh, Curtis? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it something greater than ourselves, and it actually takes on not only a, a new form, a, a new expression, but uh, and a new association, but it, it actually has, uh, creates a picture. It has a visual effect. And getting together with other people like we're doing now, or just one-on-one, -on -one, it helps to connect the dots together. When Curtis and I were younger, exploring things together we stimulated each other in connecting dots and it yeah. was kind of a fun time in our lives huh curtis yeah it was very stimulating especially when we went after the mormons <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah we connected a lot of mormon dots and got in a lot of trouble 
<laughs> they like to obliterate our dots. I don't know. <laughs> JJ, regarding this study, I think we have to dissolve, digest each line and each paragraph and fully understand it before we try to go on and on and just chewing up pages. We have to know what we've read. Yeah, yeah. As much as possible, like I say, to go on to Algebra 2, you don't have to know Algebra 1 perfectly. You just know the basic concepts. But uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, but we want to explore it as much as possible. Now, uh, we're already gone, what, about 45 classes, and we're only half done <laughs> with the book. So uh, uh, it'll be... By the time we get done with this book, we'll have a pretty good study guide for Treaties on White Magic, I think. Okay, any other comments? What you are saying before about, um, you know, his predictions that we'd understand this more in the next generation and stuff. Yeah. I think what my take on it is a lot of that has to do with, like, progress and, and advancement that, that was missed out on or not made, not necessarily that the next generation would be automatically smarter. Yeah, like he, did, he did say, he did predict though some pretty advanced souls would be coming in the next uh, 100 years. So yeah. also, so yeah, um, I think uh, that's a good point though. Uh, a lot of the things that have happened and been developed like say quantum physics and different things like that is, has uh, give us and the discovery of DNA, things like this have actually uh, shed a lot of light on some of the things that he said. He also predicted atomic energy before it existed. And uh, so after that was developed, we could understand treatise on cosmic fire a little bit better. But um, Okay, any other comments before we sign off? Anybody have a particular time they like best on Sunday? We've done at 10 a.m., 10 p.m., and 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. I Anybody like this time a, best. Yeah, this I like this time best. <laughs> yeah. I like okay. this time here. Does everybody like 10 in the morning? Yeah. It's like going to church. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. Great for 10 a.m. Well, won't be able to make it. Sure. Now, that there's some on uh, other time zones that can't make it on this time. Maybe, maybe grumble about this time. So we. Yeah. yeah. This time's so. okay for me for now. Uh, Relina was saying something. Though. Yeah, Relina. Well, it's just that I know that there are still people who are involved in other activities, and mo a lot of them are first thing in the morning, whereas afternoon is a little bit freer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll still kind of move it around a little bit. I'll think about when to do it next week. Maybe like 2 p.m. next week. And maybe we could switch it off uh, 10 a.m. one yeah. week and next week 2 p.m. and then back to 2 p.m. and I'll have it. Have yeah, it. yeah, we'll kind of try to accommodate uh, the different time zones as much as possible. Um, this must not be a good time zone for. Uh, Europe, because nobody from Europe is here today. Don't think. Let me look. No, nobody. About seven hours uh, difference uh, where Annie's at, so I don't know. That's only going to be seven in the afternoon. It's not too bad. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was just looking at a chart before coming on, and uh, that spans all the way to, uh, well, Ken is the, the farthest away in, in our triad. And it's like, it was like starting at 1 a.m. For, for him. Yeah. 1 a.m. for me and I think 2.30 for Ruth. <clears throat> well, one thing about Ken, he, he shows up no matter what time it is. Yeah. I think uh, if it's done, done, he, he, he's, a, he's a dedicated guy. We really appreciate him. This particular time slot does seem to fit the most number of people. Yeah, it might be. We'll have to uh, do it more often. Okay, uh, my friends, we'll uh, uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. And and uh, remember to send lots of vibes to Cindy. And uh, we shall see you later.
Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.